Welcome to our next podcast, and uh, today we I've got Margaret Mary with me because she can never stay away, uh, and uh, I've got Beck, Rebecca Holt, who's uh, affectionately known to us as Beck, uh, who's uh, one of our, uh, is our psychologists who works with us here at the Women's Health Centre, uh, and Beck's just been telling me she's been here for two and a half years, and when she first came to us, um, it was I didn't know really know what to do with Beck, but we knew we had a problem, uh, uh, some issues with some of our patients, and. Beck's grown from doing half a day a week to three full days with us and uh, it really shows how uh, fundamental she is to our practice and uh, welcome Beck. Thank you Manish and thank you Margaret Mary. Pleasure. So Beck, there's always been a, you know, to to some people a stigma of coming to see a psychologist, especially in pregnancy when, you know, and I think people are very hard on themselves and, uh, you know, what I really wanted from you is to sort of say, look, it's not a weakness to come and see you, this is... Is it only going to strengthen somebody? And that's what I believe, you know. Uh, just tell us what sort of patients and what sort of people you see on your day-to-day basis, you know, and that's, that's really what I'm, we're interested in. I think one of the things about psychology, people have always looked at it in a similar basket to psychiatry and you go and see a psychologist when you're really broken and you're not okay and your your head's not right or you're seeing the shrink and it means there's something wrong with you and I would love to change that stigma because I think when you're having a baby you're never going to be on a more rapid trajectory of change in your whole life. Yeah. Mm-hmm. A woman from the time she conceives everything about her starts to, to change and her body's changing, her mind's changing, her identity's changing, and change, our brain doesn't necessarily like change. It likes things to stay controlled and predictable. So when this change comes along, we need a whole heap of new tools to do that. Mm. And I think if we don't have those tools and we're under a lot of stress of change, we start to really feel the resource Mm. difference. And it's mm. like you're swimming in the deep end and you start mm. going under. See, I, I don't know what you talk about, but you talk for a long time in there, which I'm, I'm really <laughs> impressed by. <laughs> but because I don't think I could do it. Um, but you know, um, so so, tell us what what happens. Give us give us what happens in what sort of things do you see? What do people come to you with? What what do they really struggle with in pregnancy? What are the, the main sort of well, change is the big one. Okay. And a lot of what I work with is the difference between expectation and reality. And the bigger the difference, the more talking we get to do. Right. Because it's a huge thing. What we expect of ourselves, what we expect of our partner, what we expect of birth, Mm. what we expect of parenthood, um, what society tells us to expect I think is incredibly problematic. And if Mm. you don't fit the beautiful mould who goes in and sneezes and the baby comes out and who glows all the way through pregnancy, Uh. people start thinking, what's wrong with them? And are they a failure? Yeah. Are they a failure? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And we were just talking about this, mm. you know, about childbirth and people's mm. expectations. If you have no expectations, you won't get disappointed. Exactly. And But mm. if you have expectations, and the, the harder and the more stringent you put the expectations, the more likely you are to be disappointed. Because mm. there's one thing about labour, it's totally unpredictable. Yep. And, yep. and you know, and it doesn't matter. People ask me all the time, so I'll say, oh, what shall I expect? Should I, will I contract? Will I do this? Everyone's different, and I can mm. give them a hundred scenarios, and they not be one of them. Mm-hmm. Mm. You know, so um, so just just to give me an example of your day. You know, of, of what you've seen and of what I would see yeah. in my typical day. Yeah. Well, the first first appointment I could run through today would have yeah. been about feeling really anxious leading up to delivery and fear of a delivery, given that the last delivery didn't go very well. Okay. Mm. Reality didn't match expectations. So that's fear and, of the yeah. known, is it? It's fear of the known this time. Mm. Yeah, and, yeah, and exactly. Fear of the unknown as well. And yeah. what tools can I have in place to manage this fear this time? Okay. So what sort of tools do you put in place? Well, a lot of it's about working out for the brain, psychological safety is in a sense of control right. and mm. attachment. So who are your people who are going to be there to help keep you safe? And then in terms of control mm. is about having plans for unpredictability basically the brain needs to know what's going to happen and what tools it's got to draw on when stress comes around so do you find that people who are chugging through labor and then suddenly something unexpected happens i take them for a caesar for example they're the ones that struggle more or is it it will depend how the process has unfolded for them if they've been able to talk and and one of the things i love Mm. about being in the women's health center is all the way along in antenatal appointments there's an opportunity to talk about fears as Mm. a culture we don't Mm. talk about our fears very often you're not Mm. allowed to 
be a failure and there's these wonderful ideas that you've got to get over it get on with it suck it up all these wonderful yeah. ideas yeah, yeah. i love that we're here in the women's health mm. center and they can come and all the way along talk to margaret mary about the really really hard stuff go in mm. there and discuss a hemorrhoid things yeah. that people are so afraid to ever say out loud mm. absolutely and then mm. they get into here with you when they're talking about their vulnerabilities yeah. as humans we mm. don't like being vulnerable mm. you know i I get a lot of people talk to me a lot, you know, and to be honest with you, my main understanding, and it's, it's a bit of a shame for me to say this, you know, is that uh, when I was first having a child, my wife, you know, uh, and the second time around, you know, I was terribly unempathic to my wife, you know, and it's a great um, a disappointment to me as an obstetrician that I didn't see mm. the issues that my wife was going under, you know, and um, she often says to me, she goes, you've got so much empathy for your patients, but you never had empathy for me which mm. is always disappointing you know and uh, um, and I've only learned that by being in private to be honest because I get to see patients mm. on such a frequent basis that I started to understand what their you know um, what their what their feelings are you know and you, mm. you get that good relationship that they will talk to you and if they don't talk to me they'll talk to Margaret mm. Mary and if they don't feel happy enough to talk to Margaret Mary they've got you you know mm. and I think that's it's so important for people to to, yeah. to, to, to explain it. I think to know, yeah, yeah, and to know that they can actually then go in that room where you are and just let let more vulnerabilities go out. I think, and, yeah. And yeah. fear's our most powerful motivator. Mm. Yeah. The human brain, fear overrides everything and then the stress response yeah. happens. And if fear's present in a delivery, the muscles all contract, the mm. fight or flight response That's happens, right. all the blood flows out to the arms and the legs. Yeah. You're not mm. going to have the right stuff happening for a baby to come out. Right. Exactly right. The other, yeah. coming back to you, who else was in the room today, that, mm. that scenario you gave me of your wife and the, and the time that you're in things, when you're in things, it's very difficult to be objective. Mm. Right. And the empathy, mm. I call it the empathy standoff, often between a husband and a wife or two mother and father, mm. In that time in your life, that relationship is under more stress than it'll ever be under. It goes from being between two people to now being between three people. And in a lot mm. of ways, the mother and the child, particularly in those early phases, is the two and the husband feels a little bit left out, but he loves them. Yeah. And so he goes, what can I do? Oh no, I'll absorb myself in my role of providing money. Yeah. And this empathy standoff pulls two partners apart at a time they really feel lonely mm. and want each other. Yeah. Mm. And that's one of the big things that I see a lot unfolding and happening. And mm. we need to work on prenatally too, talking about the changes that are going to come to a relationship. That you're not going to be going mm. on date night with a one month old baby mm. to maintain your relationship. Right. You yeah. know, you're not going to be able to have sex to resolve your issues like you yeah. used to do to get your intimacy back. Yeah. We've got to find new ways. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Look, I, I do say to a lot of my patients, you know, and, uh, you know antenatally you know I sort of say go out go out and have fun you know while you've not mm. got children you know and uh, you know some take my advice because I was the worst person for not being around during that pregnancy working every hour that God mm. sent you know and not ha enjoying those moments because you don't realize what a huge impact mm. having children is you know it takes over your life and even when you go away on that date night or mm. you go away for that weekend all you end up talking about as a kid. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, they define who you are. They kind of yeah. absorb. You just get absorbed into the whole thing, mm, you know. Yeah. And suddenly you're hot. Mm. And then I think what happens later on in life is as they start to move out of home, the and empty nest start all over again. The big yeah. adjustment and, happens and again. And this, this yeah. is what's coming for me now is the next step. And I'm hoping, uh, you know, that I'll probably have to come and see you as a patient. Uh, but, you know, and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and you're, you're having my work out with. <laughs> But, you know, yeah. I, think, I think that's always a difficulty, you know, because I'm, mm. I'm staring down the barrel of my daughter, my eldest daughter, leaving home. So all these life mm. events seem to be having, they do, they change you quite. They change mm. you profoundly and you're not ready. Yeah. You're not always yeah. ready for what's coming. And one of the things I like about working in psychology with pregnancy, mm. it's a change that you know has to happen. Yeah. That yes. person's going to have a mm. baby. They're going to deliver yeah. a baby. They might lose that baby along the way, but change is inevitable mm. and it's yeah. coming in a certain time period. A lot of our other life stages, change just happens to us and we have to adapt. Yes. I think psychologically there's a wonderful window antenatally to get ready to pre be prepared for change, to be as strong as possible once it happens. Mm. Right. Mm. Okay. Mm. 
Um, so ideally girls should see you earlier than later? If I see people earlier and we get expectation and reality close together, yeah. they tend to fare much better on the other side. Mm. Right. And, and when women come to you in pregnancy and they ask for help, what stops them from asking for help? What is it that, what's the main obstacle? Is it is their partners not showing weakness? What, what is it that stops people from, because I often approach that subject with mm, people say, you probably need to see Beck, you know. And Ashamed. Really? Ashamed. People are happy to come and see Beck, but not come mm. happy to come and see the psychologist. Mm. I quite like working with men too, and I, mm. I find that they like coming here because it's called the Women's Health Centre, and yeah. if they were to bump into anyone, there's no reason they'd be here. Yeah, yeah. Okay. You know, yeah. we've still got a huge issue about coming to see someone to get help yeah. because you're not coping with the situation. Mm. Yeah. How is it your fault if the situation is incredibly stressful? Do you, do you think, mm. you know, we all live very separate lives now, you know, we, we, the family nucleus has split quite dramatically and we all have our own homes. And do you mm. think that's had a, a bearing on who we've become? Because, you know, my parents live on the other side of the world, you know, and in the old days we'd all live together, you know. As, do you think mm. that's had a detrimental effect or do you think that's had a, uh, is it a good effect or that we're all separate, you know, because my nucleus now really is predominantly my wife and two children. So. You know, mm. it's not the extended family so much. You know, they, obviously oh. they still mean a lot to me. You know, yeah. but at the end of the day, my priority seems to be here. You know, and not being able to have that on tap is that you know the experience of your parents or whatever, whether you like them or not. You know, we all have yeah. our phases. <laughs> <laughs> we all have our phases yeah. where we, we don't like our parents. Mm. But, you know, but at the end of the day, they do have a wealth, of, and you don't always like what they say. But sometimes when you don't like what they say, is because it's they're yeah. saying the right thing. Yeah. And, um, I, I don't know if that's had a bearing at all in it. I, I don't know. What do you think? I, I think we've had a big shift about expectations generally mm. in a generation as well. Yes. Coming back to the family issue, yeah. you've got, you know, the what I call the fourth trimester or that first four months is so important to look after not only how to breastfeed, mm. how to get this baby beautiful, we've got to be mother mm. friendly too. Our mums need so much care and support mm. and I think in Australia we're so lucky that we've changed with our parental leave. A lot of other countries don't have that opportunity mm. but we've also gone back to having to be two income families and the yep. pressure mm. for that is huge often when mm. there is no family support and childcare is in the equation and that's another huge mm. adjustment if we're mm. having babies later we're getting to women are getting to a really good point in their career mm. when they've got a lot of control and a lot of sense of what they can do and what they're capable of and then they have to leave that and do something where you can't plan you can't have control you can't strategize mm. you don't get a performance review where you get a bonus um, yeah. It's a big adjustment. Having to be present with that baby all day, every day, is a big shift for the brain mm. that hasn't done that a lot. Mm. Mm. And that change in identity, um, I work a lot with mums who will come back after that when they've gone back to work and they're treated as inferior because they're part-time or they're making that choice to balance yeah. their yes. children yeah. or you know they've only got childcare available to them two days a week. It's, it's, it's a really big change for the generation mm. that we're in now. Right. What, what, what's the answer to that? You know, what, the answer to yeah, that? What's the answer to that? You know, because I, I agree. I think you know, even in, in medicine, you know, when you watch women come back from having children, their confidence isn't there, you know, they are treated mm. slightly, they're only there two days a week, you know, their training's mm. not as good, you know, and they struggle, you know, and uh, what, what, where, we don't really have, there's no real answer, is there, because those children will always be there and their work will always be there. It's definitely, I feel, an opportunity to be pioneers in this era, to make a change. If we're going to be working, if you're having a baby at 35, mm. you're going to be working till you're 70. Yeah. Look at your mm. career. You've only had probably 15 years mm. since you've come out of uni and you're expected to work another 35. We need to look at how we, we, we work this out. We mm. need to do as a culture better, mm. but our expect coming back to our expectations on ourselves again. Mm. If your career's on hold for a little while, then how do we make sure we look after women to do better and get it taking off at the end as well? Yeah, yeah, mm. okay. That's interesting. Yeah. So, so how? Yeah, it's, yeah. Just moving on to relationships and mm. uh, how the the wife and the husband change, you know, uh, you know, and uh, it, it, it's a huge demand. You know, you're sleep deprived. You've got a screaming child. 
your wife's breastfeeding, you know. <laughs> yeah, her body's not her own anymore. No, that's right. No, you it know, belongs to this she, baby. She's probably mm. still got some, some blood loss, you know. Yep. There's all those things going on. And the, the, as, a, as a father, you know, you do feel quite helpless, you know. In that mm. you, c you really don't have much input into this at all. Mm. What are the strategies of, of keeping that? The dream alive. The dream alive. Mm, the dream. Well, relationships, I think when you think about having a baby, a lot of women and men will talk to me about before the baby came, it was like the two of them were on earth together. Mm. Then the baby came and sent them both off into orbit. It's on earth and they just pass, pass oh, each other yeah. the night. Yeah, good yeah, yeah. And what we've started to do now with some mm. women is work out before the baby comes, what maps can we have to get back to each other when the baby starts to mm. separate and, mm. and push you apart because it will. Yeah. And everyone yeah. grows at different rates. And I think for a woman, yeah. having come from never having to use their body to keep a baby alive, that change, part the mm. huge psychological changes that happen, they're mm. on a growth trajectory that's like this. They don't even know who they are anymore for the first four months. Yeah. Mm. Whereas often for the husband, their routine is fairly similar to how it was six mm. months ago. Yeah. So the trajectory is not as big. Right. So yeah. I think that's another one of the things that's really hard to understand. Yeah, yeah. And women seem to like psychological intimacy, then physical intimacy, then sexual intimacy. Yeah. Men mm. like to go the other way. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, then yeah. You, <laughs> you get a woman over here that just wants to talk and a yeah. man over here that just wants to have sex, but neither of them want to do what the other wants. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and you get right. a bit of a standoff in that first part because yeah. resources are just so limited. No. Well, she's so busy holding the baby, exactly. doing baby things. Yeah. Like when you put it down, it's so nice to have nothing in your arms. Definitely. You don't need a bloke. And, I mean, you do, but yeah. it's just sort of like, it's not tedious, but it's it's like, shit, I just want to go to bed. Meet, or my, just, own, meet my own needs for yes, a moment. Yes, exactly. I just want to have a shower. Yeah. Well, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> or it's just, five o'clock in the afternoon. Or want to pee in peace or yeah, whatever it is. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, exactly. Just that five minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah you I just know. need that little moment to yourself because you, you are so it giving. Is, it is so true mm. that guys see things in a different way to women. It's just incredible we're incredibly mm. different yeah. in many ways you know and I mean the only time you can really get a guy to listen is just before, either just prior to sex or just after <laughs> uh, there's the hot tip you know uh, because you know and it's that whole thing if, if, you, yeah, if you want something you want ask before to ask before and if you just want to just yeah. them to listen uh, you they usually it. listen if they're not asleep yeah. you know, uh, so, you've got about another two minutes yeah, after that's, that's right so it is, it's, uh, uh, it's really strange. Um, yeah. But you know what? Our dads are doing things very differently now too, you know? Like so many of our dads will go to work and they'll leave and do that dreaded commute to Brisbane mm. at five o'clock in the morning to get to work. Yeah. And then they yeah. walk in that door at six o'clock and love to be there as part of the bath. Yeah. Yeah. You know, they want to mm. be hands-on. They want to be doing all of these things. Mm. So we're noticing another big shift for them as well. Mm. But it must be hard for the women who've been looking after the baby all day and they get the good bits. The good mm. bits. Yeah, I the think good. the women are just stoked to breathe. Yeah. But I get <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> the guys that go to the mines. You know, the guys that oh, there's the a lot of those fire. flying fire. There's mm. a lot of them. Yeah. So those poor blokes want to do everything. Yeah. And I'd say, I think that for those girls, it would be harder when they get a little bit older because you've just got the, the child sort of sorted, you know, some, you know, I guess boundaries. Mm. And then along comes dad and he's so excited and let's just do everything. Yeah. And mm. she's just like, no, it's bedtime now. But it's like, no, play with me. Play. Yeah, well, so I, that I, would be... I, a bit as, of conflict a, as, there. A, as an absent father, hmm. you just want to support your kids, you know, and uh, yeah. you want to have good times with your kids. You don't want it to be, you know, You're not doing that. You, that's yeah. right. Stop and eating I, that. I certainly, yeah. certainly in our household, I, I'm not the. You're not the bad guy. No, no, you know, and uh, not on a daily basis. I by think any I means. was at home. You know, yeah, I, yeah, no I think I think that's the difference. You know, is that mm. you know I see them so infrequently. You know, I, I want that to be good. Mm. I want them to have good memories of me, not. Dad was telling us off, but you know, as you get older, you realise that the disciplinarian time was mm. so important to you who you are today. You know, and uh, mm. so it is. It's it's a it's always it's a constant battle, isn't it? You know, and um, and every family, every relationship is as different as every baby is different. Yeah. And so, yeah. what's what's coming back to that expectation and reality? We've got so many more opportunities now for comparison. Facebook, mm. oh, yeah. Instagram, yeah. Mm. all these ideals about what we're meant to look like and what we're meant to be and using that as our measuring stick, that pushes mm. reality and expectation further and further apart. Mm. And in the middle, it's individuals who are left suffering. It's, it's amazing. I, I think Facebook can change your mood in a second. Mm. You just have to read someone's post, you know. I don't have Facebook, yeah. but I watch people on Facebook and they read a post, oh, and 
they get you know yeah. some tragic things on there, some really happy things. And when you're feeling a bit vulnerable yourself, someone's yeah. having a great time. It's not you know yeah. it kind of impacts on you. You don't. I don't know. I, I don't know whether this and the forums too. The oh, girls yeah. get on the forums, don't which they? can be a wonderful support. Yeah. Which to have someone there who's mm. going through what you're going through and who just can give you that level of understanding is so powerful. Mm. But at the same time, there can be all sorts of other repercussions in terms of the comparison. Yeah. 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 Happening. That's mm. Interesting. Mm. Mm. Yeah. That's a, that's a worry, that one. It is a bit yeah. of a. I think. I think Facebook's really hard because you're in such or comparison mm. in general. You're mm. at such a fragile place when you have a baby. Like, in terms of your identity, I like to think of it like, you know when a baby deer gets its legs? Yeah. As a mum at the start, you're like that, and your leg, yeah. you've got so much doubt. You don't know how to do... You're not to the point where feeding a baby yeah. is just an unconscious thing that you know mm. how to do. Everything you're having to do it consciously, which takes all of your resources. Yeah. So a mum in that first four months is such a precious, fragile, like a little, like Bambi, yeah. you know, yeah. beautiful. Yeah. But already she's comparing to the next thing and thinking, I'm not good enough and I'm mm. not doing this right. And, and the such advice. a shame. Oh, the, the advice, advice from everywhere. That does my head in. And I often say mm. to people, if you put a list now and put the advice that you get on this side and then if someone else gives you the opposite advice to put it there, yeah. mm. it's unbelievable. And mm. I think it's, it's an exciting time. Everyone wants to weigh in on life. Mm. No one wants to talk about death. Everyone runs away. But when there's a pregnant lady, let's touch her belly. Let's talk to her. Let's ask her how she's going to deliver. Yeah. We're, we're not obtrusive like that yeah. with any other medical condition. So yeah. it's really hard mm. to be ready yeah. to start going, oh, yeah, I want to talk about my choice. I chose an elective seizure. Caesar. Caesar. Yeah. Yeah. And then the person feels like they have to justify oh, absolutely. what they've done I medically. Get, and I, that's, get mm. I get this. You know, for those who do choose that seizure, side of things and I'm 100% mm. pro-choice but you know at the end of the day you know people do feel pretty judged. awful so you know? judged. Judged. Yeah. I go look I'll give you a reason if you want one you know and just say mm. yeah. having a seizure because of x y and z you know and, yeah. um, but that's unfair you know there's no easy way to have a baby no there isn't you there's you know mm. there's you know there's gen- generally two ways to have a baby old, you know? yeah, and, yeah. and yeah. you know and some people do a uh, very few do very well and uh, just drop yeah. it out and some people struggle a bit and some mm. people have a season. You know, it's, it doesn't matter at the end of the day, but... There's a lot of um, themes with the expectations yeah. where expectation and reality are a long way apart. Mm. And one of the main ones that I think we need to challenge along the way is that when you have a baby, you're going to fall in love with that baby from the minute that it arrives. Yeah. Mm. From a neuroscience perspective, the brain can't have that love drug come flowing through while it's under stress. So this, the stress constricts the blood vessels. Yeah. You, it, while the stress is still in the equation, the oxytocin can't come through. Yeah. And a mm. lot of women have the belief, so their expectation is that in that delivery, when they have the baby, no matter what they go through, they're going to feel this instant flood of love and bond and connection. Mm. It doesn't always come yeah. at the start. It doesn't always come at day three. Yeah. Mm. Some women, they like the baby, for a while and they'll often say to yeah. me in whispered tones I think I like him now yeah. Yeah. they want to protect them they yeah. want to feed them but that love can take quite a while mm. to come through the way we talk about this magical connection we have with our baby and I think that's one mm. of the things that's really hard to recover from because we fill that void where the oxytocin hasn't come with all these psychological ideas that I was never meant to be a mum I've now damaged this baby I'm going to be postnatally depressed all of this stuff because expectation and reality were mm. so far away and now mm. the individual's left in the middle in distress. Yeah, yeah look, I, it's, it's interesting you say all this, you know, Beck, because, you know, uh, when we had our first child, you know, and Donna was there and I had the baby in my arms, she goes, she said to me, she goes, do you feel instant love? And uh, um, I just turned around and said, no, I didn't know what to, to feel, you know, and mm. it was one of the most surreal experiences of my life, looking out the mm. window over Manchester, you know, and looking out over the skies below and I used to work there and it was just the weirdest experience of my life and the the sheer weight of responsibility and everything else that was upon me it was just a big fuzzy mess you know and uh, I just mm. and I don't I, you know at that time I didn't know what to think you know and I think um it hit shock I did shock and shock mm. is a stress response that we yeah. don't often talk about we talk about fight or fly but we mm. don't talk about shock where we start sitting there with our eyes wide open processing what on earth does all of this mean for me Mm. what's going to happen how this has all changed it's really big and coming to that 
that difference that you felt standing there. Men and women have a very different perspective on delivery. Mm. Mm. Our men are often involved in deliveries now. And I, I speak to my my father who wasn't involved in the kids' deliveries. Mm. Dads are there. And their recollection, often when they're watching their wife in pain mm. and distress, they haven't got the physical pain, but they've got the psychological stress. Yeah. So their memory of the situation is completely different to their wives. Yeah. So a lot mm. of the time I'm meeting with husbands and wives or fathers and mothers to talk about what's going to happen the next time because now dad doesn't necessarily want to go again yeah. not through yeah. something that was that excruciating and to watch his wife in that much pain yeah look mm. I, it happens with my deliveries you know if there's a difficult forceps or vacuum or whatever you know and uh, the, the fathers are staring at me you know uh, and uh, you know just a wink or just to give them a bit of reassurance that it's all fine and it's all under control mm. is all that's required and when I do debrief with the mother I have the father there as well because they're you're right their recollections are so different because and they're they're almost videotaping the whole thing and and they're seeing it all and they've seen mm. it all and they've seen how hard I've had to pull on the forceps or whatever and they're almost horrified but that's quite normal you know mm. and um, and it's so important for them to be part of that process you know because they need to heal from that as well because it can be very traumatic so Beck look, really appreciate you coming in today and uh, it's a really interesting area you know and it always enlightens me every time I speak to you apart from your dodgy messages on my blackboard which do my head in my quotes uh, of inspiration yeah, your quotes They're of inspiration like, Lanish, be the change you want to see in the world <laughs> yeah thanks <laughs> thanks mate yeah appreciate that but, uh, you, but know. you are you know yeah, yeah. you are the change yeah thanks yeah, yeah. you got that at the bottom yeah. you are but look I really appreciate this we'll, I'm sure we'll do another podcast soon and uh, um, hopefully have another, the second instalment of, of it all mm. uh, and go from there thank you yes. thanks thanks thanks, and thanks Margaret Mary pleasure for nothing